You're listening to the Makers and Mystics podcast. This is your host, Stephen Roach. This is season four, episode nine. CJ Casciata is a writer and communicator who is passionate about helping organizations and individuals discover their inherent uniqueness. In his debut book, Get Weird, CJ asks the question, what if the outrageous, imaginative, crazy ideas that live inside your wildest dreams are actually there on purpose, divinely pre-installed to help others? He says, Knowing what makes you weird is the best thing you can offer your art, your business, your friends, your family, and yourself. It's the essence of creativity, the stuff of movements, and the hope for humanity. It's time to quit painting by numbers, conforming to patterns, and checking off boxes. It's time to get weird. In this episode, CJ and I discuss the ideas he presents in his book and unpack what it means to live fully and truly as that unique version of ourselves we were designed to be. As always, a special thanks goes out to our patrons and supporters of the podcast. Your collaboration has helped our team produce over 60 episodes of conversations on the creative life. And if you'd like to join our growing creative collective, and receive additional content, opportunities for discounts to our live events, and even monthly creative coaching sessions, you can find these details at patreon.com slash makersandmystics. We will have this link, as well as links to CJ's website, in the show notes of this episode. This is Get Weird, my conversation with CJ Casciata. CJ, thank you for joining us on Makers and Mystics. I'm looking forward to talking with you today. Thanks, man. Uh, same here. I, I love both of those words, Makers and Mystics, so I'm just super excited. Well, I know that a lot of your work involves helping brands and organizations find their unique identities. You've worked with brands such as Whole Foods and MGM Studios, but more recently, you've written a book titled Get Weird, Discover the Surprising Secret to Making a Difference. And this book seems to be geared more toward helping individuals find their unique identity. And so I wonder, is there a correlation between helping organizations and then helping individuals when it comes to discovering our own uniqueness? Yeah, you know, I think the our kind of natural proclivity is to think of organizations and brands as, you know, sort of these non-human entities um, that, that, that simply make money. But when you think about it, any organization, any company, it's really, it, it's just a collection, it's a community of people that's hopefully serving another community of people, right? And so when I set out to write the book, I didn't want to abandon companies and brands in writing it, I hope that a CEO or a CMO or a creative director could pick up this book and go, yeah, totally. Like I see how this would apply to really what I spend 40 hours, 50 hours a week doing. But my deeper sort of vision and goal for this writing, for this book is to help people recognize that we are all created unique and we're all created weird. And that has the power not only to transform our individual lives, but whatever communities we find ourselves a part of, whether that is a company, whether that is a school, whether that is a neighborhood. And so I think they're they're more linked than we give it credit for. And that's actually something I'm starting to get really excited about because I think I think the more soul we can sort of excavate in our companies, the better and the more we can make them feel human, the more we'll, they'll actually do what they're supposed to do and connect with people on a human level. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I was drawn to your book. Maybe it was just that nonconformist 
inside of me or <laughs> maybe it was some uh some leftover teenage angst uh, or anarchism or whatever that just you know wanted to buck the system but more than that it really resonates with my own values and and with my own vision as a creative leader within the breath and the clay creative arts movement and what we're doing here on the podcast of makers and mystics and that is that we all have been created in the image of a creator and and that we are all unique and that there's no replica there's no duplicate and you even mentioned this in the book i believe that how when we're growing up it it seems to be more of a value to fit in than to stand out and you kind of go directly against that in your book and so tell me what motivates you or why you're passionate about helping people find their unique contributions. Yeah, because I think, like you, I mean, you you hit the nail on the head. You know, we all end up becoming these sort of versions of ourselves that are safer, that are more similar to the other people around us. And we start to, if we're not careful, ignore the voice inside of us that was inherently pre-installed in us since we were children Mm -hmm. in favor of conformity in favor of checking off a box and fitting into a pattern and we do that because we're just conditioned to you know like it's so funny to me that as four-year-olds five-year-olds six-year-olds no one has to tell us to imagine no one has to tell us to create (laughs) these you know fantastic sort of adventures in our mind and just kind of run and skip through fantasy land like we do that by default but then at some point whether it's a bully whether it's a parent whether it's a a authority figure they tell us that 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 stuff actually doesn't matter and what we need you to do in order to survive in this world is to act like everybody else Mm. and that's such a lie um not of the divine right not of Mm -hmm. uh, the things that are good and uh and fair and just in this world it's a lie that kind of snakes around us from really early age. And so what I'm trying to do is sort of go on this personal journey, uh, and I'm, I'm right in the middle of it, of ignoring those voices that's one, that once told me that I had to fit into some sort of context. And then as I'm doing this, I'm sort of like, as I'm on this this treadmill, I'm trying to get other people on as well and going, hey, look, this is, this is, this is all BS. Like, let's actually mm-hmm. go back to the beginning where before the weird got kicked out of us and then what i'm really excited about is helping kids not have that happen to them and, and maybe that's a little bit of an ideal sort of vision but if i can start helping grown-ups through this book sort of realize hey you know all that stuff that you know was told to you about fitting in and conforming and stuff that that's that's actually not true and then help kids realize that from the very beginning so that they don't end up <laughs> becoming grown-ups that forget it, I think we'll, uh, you know, maybe I'm, um, again, I'm a crazy idealist, but I, th- I think our, our politics, our government, our economy, our families, our neighborhoods are, are, are actually going to be uh, a little bit better because they're a little bit weirder. You know, I think for a lot of people, the, the word weird can have negative connotations. So the word weird kind of means something that you don't want to be, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you exactly. know, and maybe that, that plays into kind of what we've been talking about already. But tell me why you landed on this specific word, because as a poet, I know, you know, that's, I, I'm always paying attention to why we chose this word over another. I'm curious, you're using weird in a very positive sense as something that, you know, you're, calling people to get weird or to embrace that uniqueness. Tell me why you chose the word weird. Well, I mean, it's probably no secret that I'm, I'm a contrarian by now, <laughs> by, <laughs> by nature. And I think, you know, I kind of hope that it's, I, I got, I got the chance to meet the guy who started the dummies brand, the, the, you know, like in the internet for dummies and chess for dummies and everything. And he said that, you know, publishers really kind of balked at the idea of calling somebody a dummy early on and it was a challenge for him to actually get these books out there in the world but obviously we know once that happened you know things really took off and so i'm kind of hoping we're in a, a certain point in culture where yes the word is contrarian and yes the word is going to turn heads but there's a little bit of curiosity and even an understanding that 
weird is actually good and that we want to be weird. And, and when you think about it, it really is the essence of any kind of brand positioning, of any kind of thing that, that we want, whether we're a leader, whether we're a company, whether we're um, you know, a family, is we want to be weird. We want to be different. We want to stick out from the rest of the noise and the static out there. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, there's stuff at risk, but that's who we really want to be if we want to get in on that abundant good life. Well, I'd, I would love to talk specifically about some of the topics in the book because they're very unique ideas and I'd love to give you the opportunity just to unpack it. Tell me, what is the myth of the caterpillar? <laughs> oh, yeah. The myth of the caterpillar. Well, <laughs> also, I'll tell you the story really quick. So I was, I was writing a bunch of this book on my friend Mama Moo's farm, who is this uh, 60-something-year-old wonderful woman who she's got this like 21 acre farm and this farm is beautiful i mean there's there's cows there's chickens there's geese and there's all of these tomatoes and vegetables and so i was writing a good little chunk of this book on our farm and it had been about three or four days that i was there kind of sitting on her rocking chair and chipping away at this thing and i wasn't really getting any kind of inspiration to, to write what's next. I was like, man, I'm on this beautiful farm. I'm kind of hoping that it speaks to me and it's really not right now. And so <laughs> the last day that I was on the farm, I was about to leave for a meeting that I was actually late to. And then she stops me. She goes, hey, come here. You got to see this thing. You got to see this thing over on this tomato leaf. So I bend down and I look at the tomato leaf and I'm like, I, it's a tomato leaf. I don't understand. What, what's, what's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> and she looks, no, look, look closer. And there's this really beautiful little insect that's got, it's like bright green. It's got like big pops of yellow and jet black all over it. And she goes, this is the caterpillar that turns into a monarch butterfly. Isn't it beautiful? And like clearly there was no question. Like, of course it was beautiful. I mean, it's a really good if you if you Google image search, it's a fascinating thing. But that's like all of a sudden everything just kinda hit me. I'm like, dude, that's the moment of inspiration I've been waiting for because I'm writing this book about weirdness and I think there are these narratives that we get told our whole lives about what weirdness is that aren't necessarily true. Mm-hmm. So Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, for example. Classic story. Everybody loves it. But I'm not on board with the idea that Rudolph's weirdness, his uniqueness, his red nose is only considered interesting or valuable once Santa and the rest of the reindeer need it to mm-hmm. actually get them out of the jam of the foggy, you know, Christmas Eve, right? I mean, that's sort of giving too much power to the people around us mm-hmm. instead of going, no, 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 like my red nose, my uniqueness, my weirdness is, is valuable just because it's actually there. And so I just want to be careful that we don't continue to tell narratives like that to our kids about their weirdness, about their uniqueness, because I think it's a false start. And so what was interesting about this caterpillar is I'm sure like you, I've grown up realizing or, you know, hearing the story that of the, the ugly caterpillar that turns into a beautiful butterfly or the, um, you know, the ugly duckling that turns into a swan. But here, you know, I'm 30 something years old, you know, in my early thirties and I'm looking at this caterpillar and for the first time in my life, I go, wait a minute, this caterpillar isn't ugly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's actually, it's actually a pretty good looking caterpillar. (laughs) So what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, look, metamorphosis is great, right? We always want to be growing. We always want to be transforming, but we can't give the power to everybody around us to help us consider that we're actually wonderful. Um, Mm -hmm. This caterpillar is wonderful just simply by existing, simply by being, quite possibly before it knows what it's destined for. And so I think about my kids, and I think about my daughter who's just starting kindergarten. I go, look, there's going to be a day, probably many days, where she might get made fun of for, I don't know, not being fill in the blank (laughs) enough, Mm -hmm. right? And for being weird. And so what I could tell her is kind of this myth of the caterpillar or Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or, or, you know, ugly swan becoming a, uh, or ugly, you know, duckling becoming a swan and going, hey, one day, you know, one day all of this awkwardness, (laughs) all this weirdness (laughs) is going to go away and you're going to be, you know, this beautiful butterfly. But if I do that, she's going to miss out on the greater opportunity of being satisfied and feeling valuable about her current state 
Like that mm-hmm. isn't that what we want for us and for our kids? Mm-hmm. So like none of us are promised really the wonder of being a butterfly, but we are promised the wonder of, of, of being a caterpillar, meaning we are promised the wonder of being wonderful right here, right now in the present tense. Man, I think that is such an important discussion to have, especially when we're dealing with creatives and artists, because there's such a tendency to gain a sense of self-worth or a sense of identity from our usefulness or from what, uh, from that performing, you know, if we, if we have a good performance, then we feel good about ourselves. If we have a bad performance, (laughs) uh, we feel terrible. And I think there's a certain measure of that that just comes with the territory. But I think what you're saying is that there's an inherent value in who we are that precedes anything that we do. One of the things you talk about in your book is the difference between your identity versus your story. How does that play into kind of what we're talking about? Is that similar? Or is that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I always I, I laugh because it's like I feel like. I feel like I'm going to get in trouble for anything in that book. It, it's going to be that. Um, that was. <laughs> that, I got nervous writing that, but I just think, look, I'm a. I love stories. I'm a storyteller for crying out loud. Like stories are great, stories are wonderful. But don't you think we're kind of living in a point in history where like story seems to be sort of the apex, and it seems to be the end all be all. It's like you know we got Instagram right. stories and social media stories, and it's all about the story you're projecting. Mm-hmm. And I think the danger with that, again, to be contrarian, is that when it comes to a story, you can manipulate the parts. You can omit things or you can add things. And, you know, I heard John O'Donohue, who's one of my heroes, say once, if you're not careful, you can confuse your biography with your identity. Mm. You can confuse your story with who you really are. And when you think about what a story actually does... Even the greatest story you can possibly think of, all it does at the end of the day is illuminate something that's already going on in your soul. Mm -hmm. It either pings who you are or who you are becoming. So you walk out of a movie theater and you're like, oh man, that was a great movie. I love that. It's not because it wrote a story within your soul. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's because it sort of held a candle and it resonated with something that's true to who you are already and so your identity is not something that you can finesse or conjure up or Mm -hmm. create it's something that's pre-installed and given to you and if you're not living from that source and you're trying to sort of grab at all these other exterior things to build it what you're really doing is just creating a narrative and that narrative may or may not be true and I think we're starting to see the effects of that now more than ever now that social media has kind of hit this saturation point and people are going wait a minute that's not who that actual person is that's a curated version of this identity that they're trying to finesse and conjure up I'm Mm -hmm. so uninterested in that right now (laughs) I really am (laughs) I'm interested in getting to know like who you genuinely really are I think that's far more interesting and far more sustainable. Yes, I totally agree with that. And catapulting off of that to one of your other contrarian ideas, <laughs> what lies behind a lot of the curating of this false persona of who we are is really an attempt to cover up an insecurity about our true identity. Mm, yeah. But one of the things that you talk about in the book is why insecurity is actually good. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I actually really love talking about that because it forces me to live out what I am saying. <laughs> Which, um, so there's obviously a type of insecurity that is, is, is not good in the sense of you don't know who you are and you're not operating out of your true beloved self. Mm-hmm. But there's also this version of insecurity that I think in the West we're very, very averse to. And I think it, it stands directly in the face of trying to do something weird and trying to be weird and trying to uh, create something unique and worthwhile. And it's the insecurity that comes with the fear of not having everything we need to be safe and secure and resolute. And if you look at the life of Christ, if you look at the life of some of these great artists and movement makers throughout history, 
there needs to be this sacrifice. There needs to be this sort of throwing all caution to the wind and going, I am going to see this vision happen. And that means I might not have what I need tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I might not have everything I want to create the life I've always dreamed of, right? I mean, creating the life, you see these messages like live your best life now, create the life you've always dreamed of and you deserve this, really stand in direct contrast to <laughs> this do what you love, be passionate about what you're doing. You know, we were trying to say all of these things in culture, but they really don't, they, they're like two magnets that are repelling against each other. So mm -hmm. if you really want to live out of your unique, true self and follow your calling and all of that stuff that, that this book is about, you have to become friends with insecurity, with with not knowing what's going to happen next. And you know, Sister Simone talks about the theology of insecurity and the the fact that in America, you know, we're always like, well, if we're going on a camping trip, you know, well, let's let's bring up the extra sweater and let's make sure we have a backup tent and let's make sure we have <laughs> you know uh, starter logs for the fire. And and this is sort of baked into our culture, right? Mm -hmm. But the practice of walking willing and the practice of of being weird and creating something new and different and imaginative in the world comes with this, and you can call it a sacrifice or you can call it a sacrament, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Of going, I don't know what's going to happen. This might not work, but I believe it's divine and I believe that I'm called to do it. And so I'm going to take the first step and the next step and the third step. And I'm going to remember that ancient scripture Mm -hmm. about birds feasting and people mm -hmm. fussing. And I'm going to believe that there's something bigger here and that I'm a child of the creator and I'm okay. Wow. I think what you're saying is important, not only to artists and creatives individually, but also to our communities of faith in general, mm. you know, because a lot of insecurity can stem from a fear of the unknown we are creatures of comfort. We like our sense of certainty. But I feel like for communities of faith to continue to be agents of change in our culture, we have to get past these insecurities and fears of the unknown. And I think the message of how our weirdness, as you said, moves the world forward is important for this cultural moment. And so I'm glad you're addressing some of the things that you are. Well, well, thanks. Yeah, and 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 really, the message is, is that yes, your weirdness has the ability to do all of those really great things, right? Move culture forward and make a difference and all that kind of stuff that we want to do. But it's something inherently rooted in who you are, not what you accomplish. And so, if you can't get that right, and if you can't come to terms with that, then nothing else is going to really follow. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to. I don't want to confuse those two. You know, I wanted to write this inspiring book that motivates people to sort of get outside themselves and do something bigger than themselves. But I didn't want to write another how-to book. I wanted to write a why book. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I wanted to write a book that answers the question: Why am I weird? Why do I feel like I am different than everybody else? that I've got this, I've got these quirks and these things about me that kind of make me not always fit in. And I, I feel like everybody feels that way at some point or about something. And anybody who, who can't admit that is, is, is you probably don't want to hang out with that person. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because A, they just haven't figured, they, you know, that hasn't happened to them yet. Or B, they're just not really in touch with who they actually are. We all feel like misfits. We all feel different. And, and, that's actually a really good thing because mm -hmm. the more we're at peace with the reality that we are created with this unique sort of set of DNA that nobody else in human history can duplicate, the more others actually feel the freedom to, to, to do the same. Like if you're around somebody who just really is at peace and loves who they are and goes, yeah, you know what? I'm crazy in this way or I'm a total weirdo in this way, but you know, it's just, <laughs> this is just me. <laughs> like that's really attractive, right? I mean, that's really like we, we kind of gravitate to those people because they nine out of 10 times, if not 10 out of 10 times, make us feel really 
safe about who we are too. It sounds like what you're saying is that, you know, this idea of embracing our own uniqueness, it has to be rooted in our sense of identity. Otherwise, it can just become another prescription rather than a natural outflow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and there's just so much stuff, I think, that rings really hollow out there about making a difference and doing something that matters. And I don't, again, I just, I don't think that's as important as connecting with your true self and living out of your unique identity uh, because I feel like the more people who do that it's kind of like an you know an exponential versus addition kind of thing right like that has the power to change culture in ways that we might not even even be able to measure here on earth yeah I love what you said that your book is more of a why rather than a how-to yeah, that's that's what I tried to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I read some of your inspirations, and I have to say, I think you and I have been swimming in the same pool for I a think while. So, you dude. know, you know, you you mentioned Thomas Merton. Uh, we talked about Rilke earlier, and then of course John O'Donohue. I mean, all of these guys. One of the similarities between these guys is that. Thomas Merton was also a poet. You know, of course, Rilke was a poet with a deeply spiritual foundation for what informed his work. And then, of course, John O'Donohue, who, I mean, for anybody listening to this, if you haven't read John O'Donohue's writings, it's like one paragraph is like this. You have to go over it several oh times. Gosh. It's just, yeah, you know. But, yeah, I'd love for you to speak into that some, how you see that relationship even between the, the maker and the mystic. Well, yeah, uh, so... There was a, a long time ago, I found myself working in this small little evangelical church, like right out of college when I didn't really know what I was doing with my life. And I remember they were talking about church music and they kind of asked me a riddle. It was like their leadership team. They were like, so do you think that church music should be poetic? Like the lyrics should take liberties and have sort of a, a poetic sort of storytelling kind of sense to them. And I was like, oh, duh, yeah, absolutely. Like, that's amazing. Like, that would be great. And they all just kind of looked at me like, oh, no. Like, we don't <laughs> no. Like, it's supposed to be straight from the scriptures, and it's but just to make, make sure that it's theologically sound and everything. And I was like, wow, I I did not know that was that was a test, but I feel like I totally failed it. And, and very shortly after, I, I quit that job and didn't <laughs> haven't really worked in... A church like that again um but it just sort of cemented in me two different ways i think human beings approach the spiritual world one is kind of like as a textbook where there if there's laws of science then obviously there have to be equally fundamental laws of spirituality and then there's this other view that's very okay with mystery and with not knowing um, still sort of rooted in truth, but that I think that truth comes from more like personal experience than it does from sort of an outer sort of knowledge of like this is the way the world works. So I can I can say in the same breath, like God is like a total mystery to me. And there are all these things that I just don't really know. But then I can also say I've had these really weird, for lack of a better word, uh, <laughs> profound experiences that have made God so unbelievably clear to me that it's, I, I can't not doubt the existence of, of, of him or her. So all that to say, one of the ways I have experienced the latter of what I just said is through these men and women who many of them have, have been dead for you know, for for centuries, um, if not decades, you know, they're decades, if not centuries now. But they're kind of these breed of writers and of makers and of thinkers who, what I've realized is they never fit in into their mm -hmm. context as well. Thomas Merton never fit in to the rigid context of Roman Catholicism. Um, mm -hmm. John O'Donohue, I don't know what his story was as a priest, but he didn't last as a priest for very long. <laughs> Rainer Rilke was all over the place. But when I read these guys, I go, oh, wow, you guys get it. Mm -hmm. You're actually experiencing things that I've experienced. And 
it's not like I don't find that in the anthology of scripture that is the Bible. I absolutely do. But I I don't discount the divine indwelling of their writings as well, or the divine inspiration of their writings as well. I mean, our lives are divinely inspired. And so we, when you, we throw around words like, oh, this is inerrant and this is inspired. And he's just, yeah, like, but, but Rilke, who's a 23-year-old misfit guy who can't really hold a job and has a ton of women problems, um, his stuff is inspired divinely too, it seems. Well, you know, I want to bring this back around to, to your book in the sense that as you were talking about all these people, it strikes me, you know, a friend of mine, Ray Hughes, he said, uh, you can always identify the pioneers because they're the ones with the arrows sticking out of their back, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's and, good. Uh, That's really you good. Know? And, um, and I think that as we kind of pursue this this path of get weird or this this path of, you know, embracing the uniqueness of who God's made us to be, that comes with a willingness of being rejected on some level before innovation kind of takes root. And, and you know, when we talk about Thomas Merton, Rilke, Flannery O'Connor, you know, all these, all these different makers or mystics in history, I kind of see that. You know, they all did kind of buck the system in some ways, not for the sake of just being a rebel because it's cool to be a rebel, but because the uniqueness of who they were was coming out of them. Yeah. Uh, they, they were living in that uniqueness. And so it naturally raised eyebrows from the system for a lack of a better term and yeah there's a there's like a line in the book that says before movements are considered extraordinary they're rejected for being weird Mm -hmm. elaborate on that for me yeah i mean it's just a you know there's a pattern that's kind of in the third act of the book that talks about how really any movement worth its salt and and by movement i mean anything that's created positive change in the world so be it democracy be it uh christianity be it the civil rights movement they all follow this similar pattern where they start off with a weird idea. They end up gathering like-minded weirdos around that idea. Then they make some sort of form of a manifesto, whether that's a living, breathing document like the Declaration of Independence or uh, for punk rock example, you know, they made all these music videos and there were all of these journalists who were writing about the movement. Um, but they make some form of a media that explains their weird idea in a way that's accessible to other people. And then finally, uh, the weirdness sort of wears off. And that's a good thing because it ends up reaching a broader audience. So we, I call it hacking the culture. Um, so the weirdness wears off and it hacks the culture and it's mainstream. So the positive side effect of that is, okay, great. We now have reached a critical mass and a lot of people are on board with our weird idea. Uh, case in point, you know, civil rights movement, then the, you know, the 1964 civil rights act gets passed. So the kind of the mainstream culture sort of gets on board with it. Uh, the bad news about that is that the weird idea has to constantly sort of go back to the drawing board and figure out what makes it weird again. Um, at some point, weird ideas kind of cease to be weird and hack the mainstream culture. And so they need to figure out what's next. And you see a lot of companies, you see a lot of movements, you see a lot of organizations, even faith institutions kind of go through that every you know century or so um sometimes the cycle is a lot shorter if you're obviously a, you know a, a tech brand you're probably running through that cycle every five years or so um we're going okay great we did it instagram's now it went from being this like total punk rock democratic sort of thing to now it's a major corporate entity <laughs> how do we how do we go back to the beginning and find our weird again so yeah you can really look at that pattern throughout history and test it and I've yet to find a, a movement that sort of steps out of that that simple pattern. Well, CJ, thank you so much for joining me on Makers and Mystics, and I uh, appreciate the work that you're doing. No, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again, everyone, for listening to the Makers and Mystics podcast. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode in the Artist Profile series. You can find us on Instagram at Makers and Mystics and at makersandmystics.com. We'll see you next time.